Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's programme. It's Andrew Murray here from Generation Builders. I want to welcome you all. Great to have you with us tonight. Um, just while we're waiting for some more people to come online, just want to encourage you as we always do to go to our website, go to generationbuilders.org, uh, check out our resources that we have on there, sign up for our newsletter, put your name, your email address in the form and we will let you know what we're up to as a ministry, we'll let you know about these broadcasts, different events and missions that we have going on around the world. Um, <clears throat> remember, if you've not got any of my books, check those out on Amazon. Check out uh, Seeing the Church, The Miracle Table, um, the new book as well, The Sound of Heaven. They're all available on Amazon stores around the world in paperback and on Kindle. Um, if you feel to give to us as a, min as a ministry to support the work that we do, uh, just taking the gospel to the nations. And again, you can go to our website, generationbuilders.org, and there is a donate button. And everything that you sow into the ministry uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, also want to encourage you as well to check out our YouTube channel if you've not done that already. Uh, just search for my name and Generation Builders in YouTube. And all these broadcasts we put on Facebook, they're uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, so that you can uh, re-watch them and also subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel as well. Tonight is a communion service and so I want to encourage you to uh, grab some crackers or some bread, some wine, some juice. I'm going to just share God's word with you for a few moments and then we are going to take communion together. Um, if you are watching this live on Facebook then do uh, do give us a like, a thumbs up, leave us a comment in the comment section and share the video as well with your family and friends. Uh, wonderful. Well, shall we get into it tonight? And um, <clears throat> let me read to you from Acts 2 verse 46. And this is speaking about the early church. And it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They brought bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts they ate together in their homes with glad and sincere hearts um whenever i i've kind of i've been brought up in church my whole life and um i always went to churches where they would they would have communion every single sunday morning uh, so every sunday morning we would take communion together and uh, communion was always kind of um taught and demonstrated as something that was very personal between me and the Lord. Um, so even the way that we would take communion, you know, there would be kind of some quiet, reflective music in the background. Everyone would close their eyes and have their heads down. No one would look at anyone else. Um, and even the pastor or the person that was taking communion, that was leading the time of communion, uh, would say something like, you know, this is a real personal time between you and the Lord. You know, just shut out every distraction, don't look at what anyone else is doing. This is just a moment between you and the Lord. I want to suggest that that is not exactly biblical. That was not how Jesus brought bread. That is not how the early church brought, brought bread. Uh, there, there's a, a word, a New Testament word, a Greek word, and it's a word koinonia. And it's used 17 times in the New Testament. And it it's, really means fellowship or communion. Um, it's this idea of relationship, of sharing together. Um, and again, some, it's often translated fellowship in our English Bibles. It can also be translated communion as well. And so communion is koinonia. And it's used in the New Testament to speak about our relationship with the Lord. We have fellowship with Jesus. We have communion with Jesus. We have uh, koinonia with Jesus. However, it is also used to speak of our relationship with each other, with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And in fact, John in his epistles, he says, look, if you can't have communion with your brothers and sisters, you can't have communion with the Lord. If you can't have fellowship with your brothers and sisters, you can't have fellowship with the Lord. When the early church took communion, when they brought bread, when they, they had the Eucharist, it was not done as part of a religious ceremony where everyone had kind of got their heads down and they were looking at the floor. No, it was done as part of a meal. 
they, they called it the love feast. People would come and they would gather together in their homes and they would have a meal together. Uh, they would they would fellowship together. They would uh, they would all bring food, and th there would be laughter and joy and fellowship and and heart to heart. Not just kind of uh, on a surface level, but there would be real deep uh, fellowship that would go on. You know, they would be to coin a, a modern phrase, doing life together. And then, as part of that meal, there would come the official moment where they would break bread and and drink wine in remembrance of the Lord. Uh, but but communion for, for the early church, it was not something that was just personal between the believer and the Lord. Um, actually, it was something that was part of a wider fellowship, a wider, uh, uh, wider communion with the body of Christ. For the early church, um, when they met together, it was not done in rows with everyone looking at the pulpit or the stage. No, it, they would be gathered around tables and they would look at each other. They would interact with each other. That's why Paul said when you gather together, someone brings a prayer, someone brings a word, someone brings a tongue, someone brings a song. There was that fellowship aspect and that is what New Testament communion is all about. Now in this lockdown that we're currently in, um, many of us, we've been taking communion in our homes just with our families. And I believe that that is a real powerful thing to do. Uh, you know, we often take communion together in our home, in our family, uh, with our family. Smith Wigglesworth, he used to take communion every day in his home. He said, you know, it was part of living under an open heaven. I believe, you know, we've been looking at, at communion, uh, you know, during these videos. And if you want more, then buy my book, The, the Miracle Table. Communion is multifaceted, it's multi-level, and there, there is a part of communion which is very personal between me and the Lord. I use communion to draw closer to the Lord. I use communion uh, to receive healing and, and the anointing of God and, and as part of spiritual warfare. Uh, th these are all powerful aspects of communion which you can do just on your own or you can do it with, uh, with your family. However, um, that is not the full picture of communion. Really, uh, communion in its fullness can only be done as we gather together in the body of Christ. And one of the uh, the hard things about, about lockdown um, is that, yeah, we can worship in our homes. We can pray in our homes. We can read the word in our homes, but we cannot take communion with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And when we come and we gather as the body of Christ and we take communion, we're recognizing I am part of something bigger than me. I am part of a family. I am part of a body. When Jesus, when his body was broken on the cross, his body was given for the whole world. His blood was shed for the whole world. And when we gather as a church and we take communion, I am recognizing I am part of the body of Christ. I am part of something much bigger than me. In fact, something that's much bigger than just my local church uh, or my, my, my small group. I am bigger. There is a, a church, capital C, the global body of Christ. And when we take communion, we are reminding ourselves that I am a part of that corporate body. Now, um, whenever um, we would take communion in church growing up, uh, the, the pastor or whoever was leading the communion would always read the same passage of scripture uh, before uh, before the, the, the bread and the wine were distributed. And it's a well-known passage um, found in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, these are the, the words of, of the Apostle Paul. He says uh, in verse 23, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, so far, so good. I remember, you know, the pastor would read those words and, 
there would just be a great atmosphere in the air. Yeah, we're coming and we're remembering the, the death of Jesus, the cross. But then it would start to get a little bit heavy as he would read these verses. Therefore, whoever eats the bread, drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Wow, that's heavy stuff. Uh, so the, the pastor would read here that, that it was possible to take communion in an unworthy manner. Um, and, and in order to do so, you would be sinning against the body and blood of the, of, of the Lord. That's serious stuff. And it goes on to say that, that we have to examine ourselves before we, before we take communion to make sure that we're not doing it in an unworthy manner. And in fact, it goes on to say that some people in the church have got sick and some people have even died because they have taken communion in an unworthy manner. Wow, that's powerful stuff, challenging stuff, isn't it? Is it possible to take communion in a way that is unworthy and it actually cause you to be sick? It actually, premature death could come because you take communion in an unworthy manner. Well, that's what Paul seems to indicate. Now, what is an unworthy manner? That's a pretty important question, right? Because if, if I'm doing it in an unworthy manner, I could die. So I better make sure that I'm not. So I got to know what it is. I remember as a kid, kind of um, during communion, sometimes I would have one eye open. And sometimes I would notice that certain people in the church, when the bread, the wine was brought to them, they would kind of go like this. And the servers would kind of, there would be like a knowing look and the server would go to the next person. And sometimes on the car ride home, I would say to my parents, you know, why didn't so-and-so take communion this morning? And, uh, you know, they would say, well, they must have sinned this week. Uh, the inference being that taking uh, communion in an unworthy manner was taking communion when there was sin in your life. And so therefore, when the pastor said, you know, examine yourself, what you were doing, you were examining yourself to make sure that you were holy and righteous and pure. And if you weren't holy, righteous and pure, don't take communion. That's always what I assumed. In fact, even up, up until just a, a few years ago, I, I just assumed that that's what it meant until I actually read the scriptures. Taking communion in an unworthy manner is nothing to do with whether there is personal sin in your life. That is clearly not what Paul says. In fact, if you come to the communion table and there is sin in your life, it is the, the dumbest thing in the world to not take communion. You know, the, the, the whole point of the body and the blood is that the body was broken, the blood was shed so that you could be forgiven. So if there is sin in your life, don't reject communion, take communion. That is the time to get forgiven. That is the time to get washed. That is the time to get clean, to get right with God. It is the most stupid, it makes no sense whatsoever to, to say you can't take communion if there's sin in your life. No, if there's sin in your life, that's when you should be taking communion. That's when you should be getting right with God. So what does it mean to... Um, to, to take the bread in an unworthy manner. Well, Paul clearly tells us in verse 29, anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul tells us very clearly what eating in an unworthy manner is. It's nothing to do with, you know, is there sin in my life? It's this. It's eating communion or drinking the wine without recognizing the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? It's the church. It's what Paul tells us, right? The body of Christ is a church. So if I take communion, if I break bread and drink the cup without recognizing the church, or another translation says, without appreciating the body of Christ. In other words, if I make this just all about me and the Lord, but I don't recognize, I don't appreciate 
the church, the body of Christ, then I am eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. Because the body and the blood, it speaks about our unity, our fellowship. Christ died not just for me, but for his church, his body, his bride. And so to reject his church is to reject him, to reject his sacrifice. And actually, the whole context of 1 Corinthians 11, you have to read the preceding verses. Because what, what Paul says, he says in verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each one of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Look at what Paul's saying here. Remember, communion for them was part of a meal. And, and the, the, the implication being that everyone would come to, and they would get their plates and they would put the food on their plates. And some people were so greedy and so selfish that they would pile all the food on their plates and they would leave nothing for the, for the other people. And some of those people were, were poor. Some of those people didn't have a, a meal at home. And so these people were feeding themselves and others were going without. These people were drinking the wine so much they were getting drunk and there was nothing left for anyone else. It was all about them. Church was all about them and they were rejecting their brothers and sisters. They were rejecting the church. They were rejecting other people, the needy. Paul says, don't you realize when you take communion like that, you're reading judgment upon yourselves. That's why some of you are sick. That's why some of you are dying. Not because you've taken communion and you're not right with God, but because you've taken communion and you're not right with others. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon of the Mount? When you come to the altar to worship God, if you've not yet gone and reconciled with your brother, then, then you don't bring your gift to the altar. God will reject it. It's exactly the same principle. Eating the cup in an unworthy manner is not really to do with my, me and my relationship with the Lord. It's to do with my relationship with you. If there's unforgiveness in my heart, if there's bitterness in my heart, if there's pride in my heart, if there's selfishness in my heart, if, if uh, you know, there's hatred towards a brother or sister, or if I come to church with an attitude, this is all about me. You know, I'm here to get my needs met. I'm here to get my needs, my, I'm here to f get fed myself. You know, how many times do people, they go from church, oh, I didn't get fed this morning, or I didn't like the worship this morning, or, you know, I'm not being used. They think that church is all about them getting an opportunity. You know, my ministry isn't recognized. You know, I'm never used in this church. It's me, 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 me. And then we come take communion which is all about God so loved the world. His body was, was given for the many. His blood was shed for the many. Paul says when you come like that, you're reading judgment on yourselves. You're reading in an unworthy manner. You, you are not recognizing or appreciating the body of Christ. In chapter 10 and verse 17, Paul says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. This is what Paul is, is showing us what communion is about. It's about us recognizing the body. When we take communion, we are recognizing our need for the body of Christ. I need pastors. I need leaders. I need fellowship. I need to worship corporately. I need uh, the ministry that others in the body of Christ can, can wash my feet with. I need to hear the apostles teaching. I need to be part of something that is bigger than me. And that is what I am recognizing every time I take communion. When I take communion, I am it's, a, it's an opportunity, not just to get right between me and the Lord, but to get right with my brothers and sisters. If there's any 
offence, if there's any bitterness, any jealousy, I've got to get that right. I've got to get that sorted before I take communion. So we're going to take communion right now and we're going to thank God for the body of Christ. Now it may be that you're watching this today and you have been hurt by the body of Christ. Maybe a brother or a sister mistreated you. Maybe a pastor or a leader mistreated you. Such a, a terrible thing to happen. But remember what we read. It says of Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he brought bread. On the night he was betrayed, he took the cup. Jesus was betrayed by one of his very own disciples. One of those that he had invited into fellowship with him had betrayed him. What was Jesus' response? Was it to walk away from fellowship? Was it to get angry? Was it to get bitter? Was it to, was it to allow his heart to become hard? No, it was to take communion. If you have been hurt, if you have been betrayed, if you have been damaged by the body of Christ, the best thing you can do is take communion. And as you break the bread, thank God for his body. As you take the cup, say, Lord, wash my old heart, soften my old heart, the love that you have that caused you to shed your blood, that said, Father, forgive them, even to the ones that nailed you. Let that same love be in my heart. As we take communion, it's an opportunity to rejoice with those in the body of Christ that rejoice and to grieve with those that grieve and to hurt with those that hurt and to mourn with those that mourn. It's not about me or you. It's about his body. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you, Lord, that we are part of the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you right now for your blood that was shed for the whole world. God, give us your heart of love and compassion for the church that you died for, your bride that you shed your blood for. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. God, be with those that are hurting right now. Bring, be with those that are suffering persecution right now. Thank you for your church, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, God is good, isn't he? Before I leave you today, um, I want to show you um, just a short clip of a miracle that took place when I was in Argentina a few years ago. This is one of my favorite, um, the most powerful um, healings that I've ever seen. Um, this happened in the street. And it was not in a church service. We were just in the street and we ended up praying for a lady who was deaf and mute. And uh, God opened her ears, loosed her tongue. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was that this lady who, I don't know, she looks like she's in her 40s. Um, she had been deaf and mute from birth. An incredible miracle. And I want to pray that this will be a blessing and an encouragement uh, to you. I want to thank you for watching tonight. Uh, do share the video, like, comment, all that stuff. God bless and we will be back tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, this is, uh, we're here in the town of Chankany and this is Cecilia. Uh, we've just prayed for her, everyone's gone home. Uh, but this lady was deaf in both ears and mute. And uh, as we just prayed for her, God's opened her ears and uh, she's begun to speak as well. Yeah. So, um, grande es el señor. Amen. Yeah. Uh, could, could she just step forward? Puede venir aquí un poquito. Uh, Natasha, can you just stand behind her? Natasha. I just... Okay, when Natasha claps, you clap. When okay. Natasha does this, you do this. Okay? Okay? Escucha. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, say Jesus. Dice Jesus. Jesus. Dice Jesus. 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 No habla. No, pero, no, 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 pero estamos ayudando a hablar. Pero puede decir Jesús. 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 Un poquito.
Praise Sus God. Well, okay, you can see God just totally Cecilia. opened her ears. She's starting to. Cecilia, Jesús de sí. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She Praise God. It. And she's she's beginning to learn to speak here. How long has she been like this? How long? Uh, Cuánto tiempo ha sido así? From birth. From birth? Wow. Wow. Praise God. Glory to God.